We'll start with three, uh, three ohms. Oh. 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 Om Sahana Bhavato Sahana Bunato Sahaviryam Karavavahe Tejasvina Badi Tamas Duma Vishavahehi Om Shanti 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 So we are in this text called as Naish Karmi Siddhi, which consists of four chapters. We have finished two chapters. And uh, this text is a fairly big text. And uh, it consists of 508, uh, uh, it, it consists of uh, almost 400 uh, verses, 423 verses and roughly about 100 verses in each chapter. This text is, as I explained to you before, is written by Sureshwar Acharya, who was a disciple of Shankaracharya. And it is almost 2,500 years old. This text is 2,500 years old. And uh, still people are studying this text, like Shankaracharya's texts. This is supposed to be an advanced text for people who have done the Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads and who want to dwell more on the reasoning aspect of our real nature. See, uh, as I explained to you before, our real nature is Atma. Now, this Atma has been defined as not the three bodies, not the five koshas, not the three states of experiences. Is, is there anything apart from this is the question. And the scriptures tell us, yes, there is something. And that is called as consciousness. So all the time, right from Tattva Bodha onwards, we are trying to understand this consciousness, this awareness principle. And in this text also, what is taken up for discussion is this consciousness. And the four chapters are divided in such a way that the first chapter mainly deals with objections from uh, opponents of Vedanta. The first chapter had three Puropakshis or objectionists. And they, their contention was what? Their contention was, okay, you want to know Atma, you do karma. That means you do some rituals, some fire rituals, and then you will get some merit out of that, and then you will reach uh, you will get, you, you will reach, say, Swargam or heaven, and there you will get this knowledge. The rituals will give you this knowledge. That was what the what the opponents were saying. Whereas Shankaracharya clearly says this will not work because what we are discussing is not karma. There is an there is atma which is without any karma. Without any, it is actionless. So that particular aspect of actionless Atma is the subject matter of the whole four chapters. Actionless Atma. Naish Karmiya means something called as Atma, which never does any action, but in the presence of which all actions take place. 
in the presence of sunlight all actions take place on the earth so similarly atma is in its whose presence everything happens but itself is not an act, agent of any action so the first chapter was dealing with uh, uh, karma versus jnanam what is more important is karma important or jnanam important and sureshwar acharya proves that it is going to be jnanam which is important for liberation of a individual suppose i want to know or uh, uh, remove my finiteness the only way to know is no atma then the second chapter is a very important chapter and the most important chapter out of all the four chapters why is it important because in this chapter we find how i can differentiate atma from anatma that means atma means pure awareness and anatma means what body mind and the universe our sense organs the sense objects outside these are all anatma body is also anatma anatma means not atma and there were five indicators or five differences which was pointed out in the second chapter which is very important at any time you want to know who what is my real nature you must study these five features at and at the say, uh, and uh, by studying these five features you will arrive at the real nature of atma what are the five features number 1 drishyatvam drishyatvam means seen whatever is seen is an object of experience it is not the subject i so drishyam is object adrishyam is the subject not seen or the seer is the subject so this is the first way to discriminate what is atma and anatma anything which we see all objects of experiences starting from the objects in the world that means the form the sound the touch the taste all this is anatma it is not me we are trying to understand what is that real nature of me i i know that i exist i know that i am i know i know the knowing faculty is there that is called as consciousness awareness so that is the first feature consciousness cannot be seen whereas all objects can be seen this is one of the most important factors to know who you are any time suppose you say i i know my mind therefore immediately what it is drishya it is seen that it is seen by who by yourself and who is seeing it it is the consciousness so the seer and the seen cannot be the same therefore this see seen is anatma seer is atma the second one is bhautikatvam this is a sanskrit word what it means is all the seen objects which are made up of five elements anything you take any object which is experienced by us is made up of five elements and then i also discussed how the five elements are constituted to bring out the five sense objects and each of the sense organs are also coming out from five elements so it is only an interaction between the sense organs the sense objects and the five elements which are all interacting with each other so what is not matter principle is atma so matter and consciousness that is the second difference the third difference is sagunatvam sagunatvam means what anything which has got a guna 
guna means attribute so anything with attribute like color like taste these anything with uh, in, uh, any attribute like the height of a person everything is an atma the color of the body color of the uh, you know any object if it has got an attribute it means it has got a guna well, what about atma does it have any guna no atma does not have any guna it is called as nirguna so i have to negate all the objects in creation which has got gunas we can also talk about sattva rajas and tamas sattva means no, uh, the attribute of knowledge purity rajoguna means activity then we have tamoguna means substance dravyam so atma is nirgunam there is only one nirgunam entity in the whole universe that is called as consciousness that awareness principle so even now i if i want i can just tell myself i am that pure consciousness which is nirguna i am the pure consciousness which is a bhautikam it is not a it is not a part of the five elements it is not water it is not air it is not space but it is the knower of all this the knower of space the knower of uh water the knower all the five elements are known by whom it is known by the consciousness so that was the third factor then the fourth factor is savikaratvam savikaratvam means any object with form because it has got form it can change if it has got a guna it can change whereas atma what happens to it it doesn't have a form it is formless therefore because it is formless we say atma is nirvikaratvam that means there is no modification body has modifications like birth growth decline disease death these are all the modifications of body because it has got form it has got uh color it has got attributes and a formless entity cannot have any modifications this is how we gain we differentiate awareness principle from the objects the last factor is agama pahitvam that means what arrives and departs the body arrives and departs the thoughts arrive and depart the whole world arrives and departs in waking it is there in, in sleep it is not there so for me for me the awareness principle this world also comes and goes but what doesn't come and go but is always there is this consciousness so this is how atma and anatma these are the five basic features we should always remember like we remember the three points about the atma about the anatma we should always remember these five points it will it will help us to differentiate that atma which we are discussing in almost all the texts then after doing this discrimination in the second chapter there was another topic which was very important and that is the nature of anatma and the nature of atma the nature of atma is it is always there it is existent it is called as satyam it is there in the past it is there now it will be there in the future how do i know it is there in the future we have to take the proof which is given by the shruti from the 
what the scriptures tell us. We, we have faith and with faith we say, yes, I, the Atma, will continue after the death of the body. I was there before the birth of the body. I am there without the body even now. Body is an appearance. In the sleep state, I don't see this appearance. It disappears. The whole world disappears in, in my sleep, not for others sleep. If others are awake, they will see the world. So, what they say in the, in the scriptures is, the second lesson is that the anatma is an appearance and anything which is called, which is an appearance like the dream, there is a word in Sanskrit, it is called as mithya. Mithya means it can be experienced, you can have transactions in that, you can have utility of that, exactly like the dream. We, can, we have transactions in the dream. A dream is useful to us. And dream has got the experienceability. But we know that it is not real. It is not real because it, it is an appearance. So similarly, this anatma which we experience in the waking state is mithya a appearance. If it is an appearance, then it has no independent existence. Like the dream. Unless until the waker is there, there is no waker is the substratum for the dream. Similarly, the world of waking. The substratum for the waking world is Atma. And this knower and known and the knowing process, all the three, they are mutually dependent. Unless until, that means without the knowing instrument, you cannot be a knower. So all the three, the ego, for example, I, the ego, who is an experiencer cannot independently experience without sense objects, without the knowing instrument like the sense organs. Therefore, we say this world is mithya, it's an appearance. And this whole matter principle has got a seeming existence, not a real existence like, like Atma, but a seeming existence like the dream. And there is proof also from Kaivalya Upanishad. There is a, a proof which I last week I had discussed that uh, uh, a verse from Kaivalya Upanishad, which says that there is no earth, there is no fire, there are no fi uh, uh, five elements. This is what the realized person says. If the realized person says that I alone am, I am Atma, but the world is not there, this is what you will say if you are woken up in your sleep state. Imagine that you are woken up in the sleep state, what will you say? As Atma, when you are woken up sleep, from sleep in sleep, that means what happens is, you will say, I don't see the world, I don't see my body also, and I am there. That is what is quoted in Kaivalya Upanishad in the 23rd and the 24th mantras. It says that the realized person sees no world. Therefore, but at the same time, does he, does he experience himself? Experience means what? Does he know? Does he, does he exist? Yes. Atma exists without the world without the notion of I and mine in sleep. So that is an argument which is used for saying that this universe is an appearance. These are very important topics in the field of Vedanta. And uh, these topics, if you can understand clearly and reason it out, it will help in 
uh, in uh, having Brahman Nishta. That means Nishta in Atma. Nishta means what? Uh, 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 I have a firm firmness in the knowledge that I am Atma. The entire uh, Anatma, they say, that it comes from ignorance of Atma. Now, the ignorance of Atma causes sorrow. And this sorrow, and what if I want to remove sorrow, what should I do? I must have knowledge. To remove ignorance, I must have knowledge. And where do I go for this knowledge? We go to the Shruti. Shruti means we go to the Veda and try to get the knowledge of Atma. Because that is the only text available which teaches us more about our nature. So all this which I have spoken in the last 20 minutes is basically chapter 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 2 is very, very important. It discusses the five features of Atma and Atma. It also uh, uh, teaches us how to know, how to see this world as an appearance. In almost all the texts, this is the topics which you will get. Even in the next topic, which in the next text, which we are going to uh, study today, there also you will find the same that Mithya, this nature of Anatma is Mithya, and then Mahavakya, which are will come, and then we'll say that I am that pure consciousness. So this is the way the teaching goes in almost all the higher texts. There will be, if you go into the text proper, you will find a lot of logical reasoning attached to it. There'll be opponents to the view, they will throw up some objections, then there will be an answer by the author. And then it goes on and on. There are 4,000 pages of notes which is available for this text called as Naishkar Siddhi in the website. It's a huge text, almost like, uh, you know, uh, it's a Sanskrit text and uh, very detailed. All details pertain to reasoning. And uh, you have to go step by step in reasoning, otherwise you will not get the, uh, get the idea of what the objection is and what the answer to that is. Now let's come to the third topic, third chapter. This chapter is basically dealing with two topics, uh, three topics. One is called as Mula Avidya. The second topic is Mahavakya Vichara. And the third topic is Puro Pakshi Nirasa. Mula Vidya means ignorance, self-ignorance, which leads to self-misconception. So self-ignorance leads to self-misconception. This Mula Vidya, now we'll go into each of these topics. We will cover chapter three and four today. And uh, if time permits, then we will uh, go to the next text. Uh, also, so Mula Vidya, Mula Vidya means what? Mula Vidya means ignorance about Atma. Avidya means ignorance. Mula means the root ignorance. We are not talking about the uh, ignorance about the objective universe. That is Everybody has some objective ignorance or, 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 or some or always. You may know Spanish, you may not know Japanese, you may know, uh, you may know uh, Mandarin, you may not know uh, China, uh, you may not know uh, a, a, a Korean language, you may not know so many things which we don't know. Here we are not talking about objective ignorance. We are talking about the subjective ignorance. I don't know that I am pure consciousness. That is the fundamental problem for all of us, right from birth. We have this ignorance. At birth itself, we don't know who we are. The body grows, we go to school, we learn some objective sciences, 
which gives us a job, then we earn money, we get married, we have children, and then life goes on, but we never know our real nature. We never ask the question, what is my real nature? Is this whatever I've experienced so far in life, is this all to life? Or is there any truth behind this body and mind? So that knowledge, which we don't have, but at the same time, we know that we are there. You see, I know I am, we are self-aware, but I don't know what is this awareness. I know the body, I'm aware of the body, I'm aware of the, uh, all the objects in the world, but I never ask myself, what is this awareness? So when we ask this question, Sureshwar Acharya, he says this ignorance, our Swarupam, which is called as Atma, is not known. Now, is this ignorance existence or not? So that is what is said meant by is ignorance. What is the sorupam of ignorance? Sorupam means what is the nature of this ignorance? Is it sat? Is it existent? Or is it asat? Asat means it uh, sat means it 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 can't be uh, negate. Uh, sat means it is always there, but ignorance goes away when we bring the sakshi pramana. That means the moment I come to know I am the awareness principle, this ignorance goes away. There is no more ignorance about myself. I may have obstacles after learning that I am pure consciousness. I may have obstacles to this knowledge to make this knowledge firm and abide in it. But the moment I come to know that I am this pure consciousness, this ignorance goes away because I know, this, I know the subject now. So the only way ignorance goes away is by knowledge. Then can, it, can we say it doesn't exist it is asat. We cannot say it is asat because it is experienced by all of us. If you ask any lay person, he will, he will not say that I am pure consciousness, I am awareness principle. He will say I am a female, I am a... Uh, I, 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 I mean, they will give all the particulars of the body, of the mind, what they are related to, but they will never say that they are pure consciousness. So, Ignorance is experienced, therefore it is not asat. Asat means non-existent. Ignorance is not sat because sat means whatever exists in all three periods of time. Ignorance goes away when I come to know that I am that pure consciousness and I can exist by myself. Therefore, we say that this ignorance is sat asat vilakshanam. Vilakshanam means it is beyond existence, beyond non-existence. It is something other than existence and non-existence. That is why we say ignorance is anirvachaniyam. Anirvachaniyam means what? It cannot be explained. We, we don't know from where this ignorance has come. We don't know since when it has come, but it is there, I know. And it goes away also, I know. So this is the nature of the sorupam, which is the nature of ignorance. I mean, if you go into the text, there, there's a huge description of this ignorance. Uh, you know, you, one can study this ignorance for almost like 15, 20 hours based on this text. There is an introduction portion in this text, very, very famous portion. It's often quoted in other texts also. Chapter three, the first introduction of this ignorance. What is this ignorance? How does it come? 
and so on. The full details is explained in Naishka Mesiddhi only. This is the main text to know what is this ignorance factor. Especially Mula Vidya. Then the next question is, where does this ex ignorance exist? And the author says, after a lot of discussions, the final, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of objections and so on. Does the ignorance rest in anatma? Is it, is it, there, is it there in the body? Then the, uh, uh, they say it cannot exist in the body because ignorance has to be in a conscious person. It has to be, one must be conscious that one is ignorant. Therefore, it has to, the resting ground for ignorance is ashraya is the resting ground and consciousness is the resting ground for this ignorance. Then what is the object of this ignorance? The object of this ignorance is the atma. So three factors we have studied about this ignorance. What is the Swarupam? Swarupam means it is neither Sat, neither existent, neither non-existence. It is like this world. The world is neither Sat, neither Asat, but it is experienced. So similarly, this ignorance is like the world. It is a, it is a part and parcel exactly like the world. It is Mithya. That is what we have understood in topic number one. Very, very important topic because these are very deep topics. Normally, in any text, you will never find this type of analysis. Then, the second topic in this text is Mahavakyam. Mahavakyam, uh, as I've told you, as I've taught in Tathobodha itself, I have talked to you about it, and we have been seeing it in many other sessions, like Tathomasi, Prajnanam Brahma, Aham Brahmasmi, these are all the special sentences which are there in the uh, which is which are there in the scriptures. And what is the definition of a source of knowledge is the first topic in Mahavakyam, which we are going to study. Pramanam. Pramanam means what? In Sanskrit, Pramanam means source of knowledge. And what is a source of knowledge? A source of knowledge is Anadigata. Anadigata means it reveals a new object. Like eyes can reveal form and color. So it is called as a source of knowledge. Ears are the source of sound. Tongue is a source of taste. The skin is the source of, is a pramana, is a source of knowledge for the touch. So these are the different sources of knowledge. They reveal a new object. Now is Mahavakyam revealing something new? Yes, it reveals the oneness between the world and the individual. It reveals the nature of Atma, which can, it is not an object of study for the sense organs. Therefore, Mahavakyam is a Pramanam. Like you say, I have eyes for the form and color, I will have to say, I have the eyes of the scriptures to know I am Atma. So this is the, the one part of the definition for a source of knowledge, which is Pramanam. Then second aspect of the definition of Pramanam, second feature of the second uh, uh, aspect of the definition of Pramanam, a uh, Pramanam is Abhaditam. Abhaditam means it is not negated by other sources of knowledge. Eyes reveal form. It can, the ears cannot say or cannot negate the form or the color. It is only eyes which is the valid source for form and color. Similarly, eyes cannot negate the sound. 
it I, ears cannot negate the touch so what is not negated by other sources is called as pramana atma can it be now let's apply to atma can atma be negated by the eyes it has it is not in the field of eyes the the field of uh, atma is the subject the seer the consciousness so the eyes the sense organs are not do not have this field at all therefore never try to say i will see atma because you it is not in the field of the sense organs never say i will hear the atma it is not in the field of the sense organs then the third uh, aspect of the definition of a source of knowledge is it should be saprayojanam saprayojanam means whatever is revealed by a source of knowledge must be useful if it is not useful it is not called as pramana so the source of knowledge if the shruti that means the scriptural words which means the mahavakyam it is a source of knowledge because it is useful to us to free our identification from the body and the mind because the shruti the uh, veda they teach us that i am that pure awareness i am not the body i am not the mind and this atma is an existent principle it is awareness nobody can negate this awareness from us none of the sense organs nobody i cannot tell you you are not conscious you cannot tell me i am not conscious it cannot be negated consciousness is ever with us you get up from sleep you are conscious you even yeah yeah you, you in dream you are conscious in sleep you are conscious you conscious of that aware of nothing is there in sleep the world is in a dissolved condition that is what you are aware of so these three are the conditions or the which define what a source of knowledge is and mahavakyam is a source of knowledge for the subject in us for revealing this atma therefore the mahavakyams have a very very important role they are that is why they are called the, the shruti is called as a, like a mother a mother will teach us a lot of things in life right right from the time we are babies she helps us to walk she helps to teaches us to read write walk so similarly the scriptures they help us to understand our real nature and what about samsara then samsara means what maya now we have discussed in mahavakyam uh, uh, we are the second topic we are discussing is what is this uh the sorrow which we face what how does this sorrow we have seen this in the last vivek chudamani also we have seen what is sorrow where does it come from all that we have seen in the previous text so here what it what we are saying is this sorrow it traps the individual in the world jeeva jagat ishwara this is how we see the world and this is the the we we see the difference between me and the world that is called as maya i will talk a little bit more about this format at the end of uh, the nashkar message the uh, portion i have a small presentation if time permits i'll take that up then mahavakyam helps a jeeva to come to binary format this this format of jeeva jagat and uh, format and binary format i will discuss with a special note now in tattva masi 
there is no prepositions like of, in, from, near, away. These are all uh, uh, prepositions. Tat tvamasi means what? You are that. Thou, tat means that consciousness you are. G it doesn't say uh, jiva is near that consciousness. It doesn't say it is, it is in the consciousness. It says you are the consciousness. So that is how the Mahavakyam teaches us th that I am that consciousness. Therefore, I have to claim that consciousness to become free from the body and mind. This consciousness is a substratum for both the totality of the world, which we call it as Paramatma, and the Jivatma. It is a substratum. There is one unifying force, which is called as Atma. Now, how does the Mahavakyam explain us this? Through the Sambandha. Through the Sambandha means it, it goes through the features of the, uh, of the jiva, of the individual. It goes through the features of the totality. And then it tells us that you remove the, the, uh, the contradictory features and you retain the common feature. The common feature between the, the creator and the created, between Jivatma and the Paramatma, the common feature is both are conscious. So we retain from Tat, we retain consciousness, from Twam, we retain consciousness, and then we say this consciousness between the totality and the individual is one. This is how the Mahavakyam Tattvamasi helps us to understand that my na real nature and the nature of the entire world is consciousness. The substratum is consciousness. In Bhagavad Gita chapter 10 and 11, for those who have done the Gita, the 10th and the 11th chapters will teach us this aspect of Mahavakya. It will te teach us how to see the entire world in the Lord and from the Lord, how do we see the entire world? Both the ways. One to many, many to one. All the vibhutis is from one Lord, we see the, all the vibhutis of the world. That means from one to many. Then in chapter 11, many to one. How can we see the entire universe in one Vishnu, in one principle, in one consciousness principle? That's why Bhagavad Gita is a very useful method, uh, useful text to understand and finally what we are as pure consciousness. Lakshana Lakshya Sambandha means removal of the contradictory fa factors and retention of the Lakshyam. Lakshya means indicative factor. That means retaining the consciousness and removing the contradictory factors. Mahavakyam reveals the oneness between the Jiva and Paramatma. This chapter deals with objections in the third topic. We are talking about Puro Pakshi Nirasaha. The third topic, this is the last topic of the third chapter. Now, there are some objects. I'm just giving you a simple, uh, 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 I'll run through it. But the detail of this, if you want to study the detail of these three objections, it will take a long time. I've just brought in, just to give you a glimpse of how they discuss this topic in the, in the third chapter. 
So one of the objects is says that Shabda reveals Jati, Guna, Kriya, Dravya, Sambandha. That means all words can only describe <coughs> if it has got an attribute, if it is related to some action, if it is a substance, or if it has got a relationship. Jati means species, guna means attribute, kriya means action, dravya means substance and relationship. One, two, three, four, five. Any word can only be used to describe these five things. But Brahman is none of these five. So how can words describe Brahman? That is what is the objection. Now, how does Sureshwar Acharya answer this? He says, uh, Brahman has Mithya Samanda, it is not Satya Samanda. That means consciousness has got a relationship with the universe, with the Jiva, Jagat and Ishvara, and that Samanda is, an, is a seeming relationship. It is useful for revealing Brahman. Even though there is no actual relationship, normally we say what consciousness is relationless. But in the presence of that consciousness, we say the entire world is appearing and disappearing. So Sureshwar Acharya, the author says, we use the seeming relationship to define Brahman, to define consciousness. Ahamkara, Atma, Mithya, Samanda. That means Atma and Ahamkara. Ahamkara means what? Ego. So consciousness and ego, what is the Samanda? What is the relationship? It is a Mithya, Samanda. Mithya, Samanda means what? It is a, it, it is an, it is an appearance. The relationship is merely an appearance. But actually there is no relationship. So, the Mahavakyam, even though it is made up of words, it can still reveal the Mithya relationship. Like, for example, we can describe the dream. Dream can be described. There is, it, is, it is Mithya. It doesn't exist. It is an appearance, but words can describe. So similarly, words can describe the Mithya relationship between the, uh, between the baker and the dream, similarly Brahman and that means between consciousness and the baker. Shabda words has got a very mysterious power. And uh, Sureshwajara uses this uh, second reasoning. Suppose a person is sleeping and then uh, the sleeper doesn't have any samanda relationship with the words. But the words, you can just call out a name of a person or just use some name to wake up a person. And the person will get up. And therefore what? These words have got the power. Similarly, the words Aham Brahma Asmi has a power to reveal this consciousness. They have the power. And therefore, Sureshwar Acharya says, that Mahavakyam has the power to reveal something which is invisible, which is not visible to the sense organs, it is not visible to anything in the universe, but it exists. And it can be revealed because we are using the words, which are words of the scriptures. The second objection is, if Mahavakya is Mithya, how it reveals Satya? Okay, if words are, okay, all words means what? Words are Mithya. Because it's, Mithya means what? They are all uh, really not there, but they are, uh, they are appearing to be there. But how can it, uh, a word which is Mithya, how can it reveal Satya? See, this is the uh, way the, re, uh, the, 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 mind and the intellect, the intellect and the mind, they, they interact to bring out reason 
uh, and logic for knowing and making our knowledge firm. So here, Suresh, uh, I'm not going into the depth, but I'm just giving you some glimpses. What it says is, Suresh says is that if you take a reflection of a face, can it reveal the original? Yes, it can. Because when you see yourself in the mirror, the reflection is mithya, it is not real, but it reveals your original face. So similarly, Aham Brahma Asmi is, I am that Brahman, is a word which is a reflection. But that reflection tells us that there is a reflecting uh, substance. There is, a, there is a original substance which is revealing this words. So that is why we say, observe your thoughts in meditation. What happens when we observe our thoughts? We come to know that there is a seer of the thoughts. And then we ask the question, who is seeing the thoughts? I can't see the seer of the thoughts, but thoughts are manifesting the seer. Like the moonlight manifests the sunlight. Moonlight by itself doesn't have the light. It gets the reflection of the sunlight. Therefore, by looking at the moonlight, I know there is sunlight, there is sunlight somewhere. Similarly, by looking at our thoughts, by hearing the words of the Mahavakya, when I silently repeat in my mind, Aham Brahma Asmi, I am Brahman, I am pure consciousness, I am awareness. When I say this in my mind, a thought, a vritti comes up. When the thought comes up, that thought reveals the consciousness. That is what Sureshwara Acharya beautifully says, like a reflected face can reveal the original face, a thought which is mithya, words which are mithya. Mithya means what? They are only uh, appearances. They can remove the ignorance of consciousness. And the ignorance goes away. What remains is the ever evident consciousness is revealed. So by what, do the, what is the function of these words? The function of these words, Mahavakya, is to remove the ignorance. Does it reveal the consciousness? The words directly do not reveal the consciousness. Words only remove the ignorance part of it. The veiling is removed. Consciousness, by, by nature, it is self-effulgent. So when I say that in sleep, you are with your own real nature. This is a knowledge. This knowledge removes what? It removes the veiling part it removes, removes the ignorance part only. It does not, it does not give birth to, no, uh, birth to Atma because Atma is ever there. So what, what, it's, what uh, uh, Sureshwar Acharya says is that the, that, uh, uh, the words remove the ignorance and the self-evident atma gets revealed automatically. You need not reveal the waker for the dreamer because he's already woken up. So similarly, Mahavakya, once it is repeated, it reveals, it reveals the original consciousness because it removes the ignorance. This is a very, very, uh, very abstract thing, but once you go deeper and deeper into the text, at some time you will get to know these objections and answers much more clearly. 
Then the third objection is Mahavakya is a message, I am free. My face, you look at my face, my face will tell you that I am, uh, you know, I am full of sorrow. My Anubhava says, my experience says I am not free. Then how can this Mahavakyam, Aham Brahma Asmi, that means I am pure consciousness, how can it remove sorrow? Because my, it is against my experience. Now what Sureshwara Acharya says is that experience is not the proof of truth. Sunrise is an experience, but it is not the truth. Mirage water is an experience. It is not the truth. Rope snake is an experience. It is not the truth. So sorrow is experienced by me, but it is not the truth. Atma is the truth. Pure consciousness, awareness is the truth. And Anubhava, reflection of Ananda is now and then. That means some, sometimes we feel joy in the world. That is only a reflection of that pure awareness, which is full of happiness. You remove the cover of ignorance and claim yourself to be that consciousness, you will always live in bliss. That is what the scriptures say. That is what the sages who have realized this Atma say. When the reflected Ananda is not there, we can claim Bimba Ananda. That means, when the body and mind are resolved in the sleep state, at that time, I can say, I am that pure Atma, pure bliss. And only when I have removed the ignorance part. Ignorance part is removed by Tattvamasi, by the knowledge of Atma. Then what happens to some people after knowledge also, they have certain obstacles. Therefore, we say you must do some meditation. Meditation is what? It is to remove the notion that I am the mind. I am the body. I am the sorrowful person. Well, how do we remove this? Because I, now I have the knowledge that I am the pure Atma, pure consciousness. So this is just a glimpse of some of the objections and answers which are there. If you go deeper into the text, you will understand much more clearer. There are many, many such objections and answers taken up in the 4,000 pages. It's all only this type of questions and answers which get uh, very deep but one needs a lot of time to study all that. The last portion, the chapter number four, is just a summary of the first three chapters. And here, uh, the author says that every experience involves two factors. One is the observer, another is the observed. The object is anatma, which is observed, like the body and the mind. But they are being observed means what? They borrow consciousness, they borrow, uh, they borrow existence. Suppose I say that my, I can see my body now. But body by itself is not, doesn't have uh, existence in it. That is what the teaching is. Body doesn't see itself. Who is seeing the body? It is the consciousness. It is the observer. So the observer is the subject, Atma. It is the possessor of the body. And what is possessed is the body and mind. Observer principle, the Atma, lends existence and consciousness to the body and mind. So even in meditation, one very important technique to separate the thought from consciousness is this particular principle. That the observed thought doesn't have existence, consciousness of its own 
because every thought is matter and who is lending this existence to the thought it is me the observer consciousness the moment i understand and apply the principle you will find that the thought goes away and then what remains what remains is pure consciousness that's all so simply observing the thoughts with knowledge of the principle behind the uh, thoughts that i am the lender of existence to the uh, thought will give us the benefit of removing sorrow it will tell us that any time the sorrowful experiences come you say it is drishyam it is seen it will go away it will not stay because that is the nature of this world it is a nature of this matter principle but you might say some thoughts keep on coming but what we have to say is every time the thought says a thought comes you say it's matter principle it will go away that's all when you practice this knowledge again and again and use the knowledge that will give you a lot of practical benefits in day to day situations the subject and object are never interchangeable that means you cannot make the object the subject consciousness can never become the object it can never be the scene object can never become conscious it is never the is always a scene we have seen this in the drigdeshya viveka also in saturday classes body mind is a complex gray area body becomes 60 years old 70 years old 50 years old it is referred as my body instead of saying this body this is what is called as mithya this is what is called as superimposition someone in the body leaves makes the subject atma gray therefore atma is not known as a separate entity there is a mixture of atma and anatma when we transact in this world it is not like black and white when we are in the triangular format i will explain to you this triangular and the uh, binary format is a very beautiful area of i'll come to that at the end of this uh, fourth chapter so how do, how does this uh, this uh, how, uh, how how do we how does the upanishads they reveal this consciousness it says first of all the step number one is i know i am a bhautikam a bhautikam means what i am the spirit i am the non matter principle and conventional instruments can reveal only bhautikam that means all the sense organs are only able to reveal sense objects which are also matter therefore the step number 2 is i know i am not the body or mind i am something different than the body and mind the consciousness is pure existence it is the observer pure existence means what when we look at all the objects we say yes the object is so and so person is that isness is what is called as the substratum and what is a substratum in my body in my, when i look at myself as the body and mind i say consciousness is a substratum when i look at the world what is the substratum isness isness is called as pure existence so this isness and this consciousness together is called as sat chit ananda atma the observer the job of existence is to lend and to be conscious i as sat chit am the substratum not only for this body but also for the entire universe we must know that there is one unifying principle between the world and me which is called as consciousness which is what the shruti is revealing to us 
that unifying principle we must always never lose sight of otherwise we will be going around in the whole world you know trying and you will never know understand you will you will in every text you will study you will be stuck but if your principles if your understanding is clear then you can apply and learn that pure consciousness and learn to differentiate the pure consciousness from this body and mind that's why in more all my uh, uh, sessions i always try to make as clear as possible the consciousness from the body and mind because once you have done that then the you already have got the benefit of the scriptures that's all that is what is called as moksha is called as liberation and each of these texts only will talk about atma and atma and then oneness how to reveal how the oneness gets revealed by dropping the uh, conflict uh, conflicting matter principle contradicting matter principle and retaining the uniform principle which is consciousness existence in the uh, uh, in the mandukya upanishad these words are used in uh, what i put here pragna vishwa taijasa these are all just some technical terms coming out from mahavakya portion of mandukya upanishad where in mandukya upanishad it says i am pure consciousness and that consciousness is given a name pragna in the sleep state it is given the same consciousness is given a name vishwa in the waking state in the dream state it is also called as taijasa these are just names don't worry about it if you can't remember it doesn't matter but what is this atma it is karya karana vilakshana the sleep state is the karanam the cause of what of the other two states of the waking and dream and what about atma is it a cause or is it a effect it is neither a cause it is neither an effect it is beyond the cause and effect therefore when we look at atma you have to say i am neither a cause of the world i am neither the effect of the world this is a very important point but when we study the mandukya upanishad at that time it should be much more more clearer it is one of the things because this is a high text sureshwar acharya that author brings that point here just to explain to us the nature of consciousness so in this particular fourth chapter uh, from 19 to 53 there is a big portion the mahavakyam is discussed and basically what he does is he applies the five features logic and says that i am the atma which is not drishyam not bhautikam not savikaram not, not sagunam and he says therefore you dump the body and mind and the sense organs into the world so it is no more gray area it is a part of the world and then paint this body mind along with the world in black that means you hand it over to ishwara the creator who is the creator and then what you happens is you are called as a mental sanyasi mental sanyasi means what you are a, in your mind you say that i am this body and mind doesn't belong to me anymore i have given it back to the world and then step number 2 is what then i hear the mahavakya tatvamasi you are that when i have dropped the body and mind as a part of the world then you can say that i am uh, a sanyasi means what i am a renunciate i am a monk mentally not physically this is what the advantage of the scriptures i can either be a monk and say i am a, i am brahman or i can be a grihastha i can be a householder i can still be saying that i am that pure consciousness after i have given the i and the mind tyagaha aham and mamata tyagaha what happens is 
this entire householders becomes a dress for me as atma i am wearing the dress coming into the waking state and then conducting the entire transactions when i go to sleep i remove this dress of the body and mind and then i go back to my original nature which is atma pure existence consciousness so our focus our center is not the waking state my focus shifts to the sleep state when i have removed my dress and then i claim i am that atma which is witnessing the blankness ignorance of the world and ignorance of the body and mind in the sleep state i am aware i am aware i am pure awareness but i can be aware of this body and mind in the waking i can be aware of the removal of this body and mind in the sleep state that is the second state so by atma and atma viveka is i understand i am the consciousness then i learn that i am the one and then i learn to be separate myself in the sleep state the, the third step is what then i learn to say i lend existence and consciousness to the body mind sense organs and the universe very beautiful portion of how step by step it teaches you to claim i am atma so you drop i and mind which belongs to the five koshas by koshas means what they are only dresses which i wear dress for what dress means it is dress for the atma atma is free from the five koshas atma is free from the three bodies atma is free from the three states it is relationless and it is ever free in this way naishkarmi siddhi teaches me that i am that relationless atma i don't have any relationship at all with the body and mind this is what is called as jnanam this is called as atma jnanam because it is knowledge this text is called as naish karmya siddhi naish karmya means what it is not related related to action atma is not related to action but it is pure siddhi that means actionless atma this text some people commentators have said that this text has got the name naishkarma siddhi because of bhagavad gita chapter 18 verse number 49 so here if you see naishkarma siddhi varamam it comes in the third line naishkarma siddhi varamam asakta buddhi sarvatra jitatma vigata spraha naishkarma siddhi varamam what it means is one whose intellect is unattached everywhere it's a beautiful verse it says it, it describes the state of naishkarmyam it describes the state of atma so one whose intellect is unattached everywhere who has subdued his own self from desire from whom desire has fled away that means there is no more thoughts he through mental re- renunciation attains a supreme state of freedom from action this freedom from action is called as naishkarmya siddhi atma is ever free from action it is not something which is gained by doing any action but it is jnanam it is jnana siddhi 
So I need to know the knowledge of Atma and through that knowledge, my ignorance, the darkness which is there in my own intellect goes away and then I can claim I am this pure self. With this we close, we come to the end of the fourth chapter the, uh, and uh, uh, that is the end of the text which is called as Naishkar Siddhi. I have taken only a few uh, points of the four chapters. Uh, the text is huge text, like I said, it's written in very abstract Sanskrit. It is not easy Sanskrit like uh, uh, Vichara Sagara and it consists of 423 verses. Uh, the chapter two is the most important. If you want to study, you can study that chapter alone, which consists of 119 verses. If you have the time, you can study all the four chapters. My objective of taking this text was only to reveal some salient features of this particular text by Sureshwara Acharya, a brilliant Vedantic uh, scholar uh, who has written a fantastic commentary on Naish, uh, Naishkan Siddhi. Uh, on, uh, I mean, he has written a commentary on Dakshina Murti Stotram, on uh, Brahadanika Upanishad, Taitri Upanishad, all this he has written. Um, now, I have 15 minutes left. In 15 minutes, I want to give you some, uh, something which I have learned from another text which is called as Vichara Sagara. It's, a, it's something which I learned. I thought I'll just share it with you. A quick uh, way in which uh, when we are studying the higher texts or when we are trying to apply the knowledge, how do I apply the knowledge? And when I listen to different texts, how, are they, how is the teaching done? Uh, it's done in two ways. I'll quickly go through these two ways. Two methods of Vedic teaching, it depends on how does a seeker look upon himself or herself. If I, if I am a junior student, what happens is the Shruti, the teaching is two-step. It's a two-step teaching. If I'm a senior student, if I've done Bhagavad Gita, if I've done the Upanishads, then the Shruti will say, you are a senior student, I will teach you in another way. So there are two ways in which the teaching is taught. Generally, Okay, I will run through these 15 points so that you can have a glimpse of both the points. It is not very difficult to understand. The first one method is called as triangular format. That means I take myself as a jiva, as an individual. I see the world, Jagat, and then there is a creator. I have to bring in a creator because I have not created this body. I have not created this world. Therefore, there has to be a creator called as Ishwar. When I look at this format, it is called as triangular format. That means individual, world, and creator. Then, when I'm looking at the world, okay, let me finish the uh, junior portion, junior student first, then I'll come to the senior portion because that'll be easy. So, Ishwara means the Lord, he has got a Shakti. He has got a Shakti means he has got a power. And he projects the waking world. So please try to understand this line of thinking. Because if you follow this line of thinking, you will have no confusion when we discuss different higher texts or lower texts. This is the methodology used for Bhagavad Gita, the junior, the triangular format. So all the uh, texts which we have generally done, small, uh, 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 Gita is on this format called as triangular format. So Jiva is a projector of the dream world, whereas Ishwara is the projector of the waking world. That is a creator who projects this entire universe every day. 
for all the jivas, for all the individuals. This is the way I look at if I'm a junior student. All of us are junior students to start with. Bhagavad Gita uh, takes this in the 16th, 17th, and 18th verse of the 15th chapter. Those who have done this, they will remember just to, uh, 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 just to uh, relate to those verses. There are two purushas in the world, Dhamima Purusha Loke, then it says that, that there is a creator and the created. Then it says that above this creator and the created, there is a Uttama Purusha. That means somebody who is formless. A creator is also with form. Ishvara is also with form. But there is something above the Ishvara which is formless, which is called as Uttama Purusha. This is the way Bhagavad Gita teaches the consciousness nature, the pure awareness nature. Then, uh, I will come to the Upanishad portion when I discuss. The Upanishad portion will discuss the other format. The fourth point with, when it comes to the students is, junior student is, Ishvara, that means the Lord, is always separate from the individual and the world. It's very simple. The creator is not the same as the created and me. The whole universe is created. There is a difference between creator and created. The fifth point to remember is in this triangular format. What happens is I am always looking at myself as the body and mind. I'm in one corner of Singapore, I'm in one corner of India, I am a finite individual, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a son. These are all the ego. I'm attached to the ego in the body. And this ego is always in Triputi. That means it is always with it always exists in time and space. The next point is. Then, as in this triangular format, what happens is we always have a question: When did Lord create the world? How did He create the world? What is the material He used to create the world? What, who uh, is uh, uh, what is the uh, uh, what is the nature of this Creator? Like a goldsmith is the efficient cause. This uh, Lord is the efficient cause. What is His nature? Is he a male or female? Is he, you know, where is that Lord? Where, where, is, where does he live? All these questions will be there in the triangular format. This format is also called Shrishti Drishti Bada. What does it mean? I see a world, Shrishti. Therefore, there has to be a Drishti, observer. This is how the teaching progresses. That means I take the world first, and then there is, is this world. Take the world as Srishti, as the fixed thing, and then I then I try to uh, understand there has to be a seer of the world, and then the teaching goes on. And then how is the teaching given in in Karma Yoga format, Upasana Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and then the final teaching is given. You are that higher principle. So ultimate teaching is what? Tathoma Sivandi. But then there is a step-by-step -step process involved to come to this final teaching. All the time I'm un under the Lord, under the Creator. That is why this format is called as Dasoham. I am a Dasa and the Lord is the Creator. Veda Purva, all the ritualistic portions, they deal in this triangular format. That means body, mind, and the triangular format of Jiva, Ishvara, and Jagat. Veda Purva is based on this creator. I am the Jiva. I want to experience different lokas. I want to experience good things in life. Do rituals, you'll get this. Do that ritual, you'll get this. You'll get swarga, you'll come back. You have 14 lokas, all that is there. My security, peace, and happiness depends on the Lord. 
I am a mortal. I am never secure. I am always in time. This is how I become. I am a junior student. Then ego. This this uh, this triangular format is ego based lifestyle. I have three types of realities: transactional reality, which is the waking state; dream reality, which is the pratibhasikam; and then absolute reality, which is uh, which is the Lord, which is paramarthika. And I am always identified with the body and mind as the self. And then I am trying to understand the Creator. I am trying to understand my nature. With reference to the Creator, it is going to be dwaitam because I am always experiencing a world separate from me, and I am affected by prarabdha karma, and I have a lot of sanchita bag with me. And my freedom comes only after I get sadhana chatushtaya sampatti. That means I get qualifications, then I have to get a teacher. Then I have to listen to the scriptures. Then I have to do meditation. Then I have to remove the obstacles, and then I will get freedom. This is how the entire flow is for a junior student under the triangular format. Go to the senior student. Senior student is a Upanishadic student. he is in the binary format he doesn't look at the world as jeeva jagat ishvara he looks at the world as what atma and anatma atma means consciousness and anatma means the entire world body mind sense organs and the universe so i am consciousness awareness body mind is a part of anatma now this is the most important and a very very uh, vital knowledge which we must remember as awareness as consciousness principle i the chaitanyam the awareness pure awareness as in sleep has got the maya shakti that means chaitanyam and i as chaitanyam i as pure awareness pure consciousness have got a power that power helps me to project the waking world and it helps me to project the dream world very very important point this is taught in an advanced vedantic uh, uh, text called as vichara sagara i am just bringing it back to you coming to you in a simple way Uh, but when we discuss that, you 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 will get to know a little bit more on this. When I am that Chaitanya, then I can apply the Kaivalya Upanishad verses, Taitri Upanishad verses, and say very easily that I am the I in me alone. Everything is born, everything exists, and everything gets dissolved from me. Uh, for me there is no five elements for me i am all alone from which the beings are born from which beings go back that is me the pure awareness consciousness so when you are coming into higher study of upanishads this is the format which you have to apply you cannot apply the triangular formula and try to understand higher texts that's what i want to convey jeevaatma paramatma are merged into atma that means we no longer have ishvara and jeeva both are only atma i the awareness principle i am of a higher order of reality this is another very important uh, point awareness principle consciousness principle is like the waker compared to the dreamer there is a higher principle awareness principle is higher compared to the waker 
then I look at the world. Then I can understand all this. It's very easy for me because then I am separated from the body, mind and the world. In me, there is no triputi. Triputi means what? Knower, known and knowing. That comes only when in the waking state or the dream state. The, the knower comes to play only in the two states. I am the adhisthana. That pure awareness can then be said it is the substratum which holds the entire universe. And this Mandukya Upanishad is this, is this substratum very beautifully explained. I am not conscious of the inter inner world. I am not conscious of the external world. I am pure Atma, which is peaceful, auspicious. It is non-dual. It is Shanti. It is silence pure silence they said there was some discussion in the uh, this in the discussion group what is that pure silence ultimate silence is atma relative silence is in the world i'm speaking i stop speaking that is relative silence but the ultimate silence is this atma which ramana maharishi wanted to reveal Creation manifests and unmanifests because of Maya. Srishti is a projection like a dream. That means waking is projection like a dream. This, this uh, uh, method is called as Drishti Srishti Vada. Drishti means what? I, uh, uh, the world exists because I see it. World is not there and I don't see it. Drishti. Drishti is very important. Uh, important here. The observing principle called the consciousness is important. Then Mahavakya teaching is very easy for me because what it says is you are that awareness consciousness. Tattvamasi. Soha means what? I am that Brahman. I am that pure consciousness. All this becomes easy. And what this is the subject matter of the Vedanta. That means the end portion of Veda deals with the subject matter the subject i when i'm in this format my peace and security happiness is my swarupa that means i am that peace i am that consciousness there is no other peace or con anywhere in the world except in my own nature i'm immortal i'm ever secure i am timeless i can claim all this if i am atma this for the senior student this is this lifestyle is called as atma based lifestyle which is what we have to learn to live i am atma body mind is mithya it is an appearance it will come and go it will uh, it is incidental and what is satyam the truth is that pure consciousness I am disidentified with my body, mind, and the universe. When I do this, it is called as Advaitam. Advaitam means what? It is one alone principle. Atma is all alone. The world comes and goes. It depends on the consciousness, but consciousness does not depend on the world. Therefore, I can say I am immortal. I am beyond time. Prarabdha feeds the body with variety of experiences. That means in the lower field of experiences, body, mind will undergo certain experiences. When others become a medium for my own karma phala, that means others are, when I have sorrow from somebody, it is my own karma phala, it is, which is coming through that person. It's not, I don't blame the world. I don't blame anybody for it. It's an experience, that's all. But it will come and go. In this world is taken as an optical illusion, even though it is tangible and useful. But the essence of the world is what? Essence is Chaitanya. In this, in this Gunatita Atma, which is the way Bhagavad Gita finally reveals in the 14th chapter who you are. I am without any gunas, nirguna. Then 
that is how bhagavad gita brings out the teaching mahavakyam i can easily say i am avastha treya vilakshana sakshi i am sharira treya vilakshana i am panchakosha vilakshana vilakshana means beyond i can easily accept them as my real nature and then finally what freedom i am not bound by the body or the mind or the universe this is how veda gives two types of teaching initially all of us have to go through the first method which is a triangular format ultimately we come to the atma anatma format and then claim our freedom as pure awareness i have exceeded by 5 minutes but uh, i thought this is an important topic so with this i will uh, also end today's talk so next week we will take uh, the next text for our study which is uh, totaka acharyas shruti sara samudaranam it's a small text we will try and finish it in one one uh, one uh, one uh, class one itself and then we will uh after that i was thinking of taking um okay i will take panchadashi first or i'll take vichara sagara first and then if uh, time uh, later on maybe i'll do panchadashi so that is how the flow is going to be so if we finish shruti sagara samudram in in the one hour of next week then we can start the vichara sagara uh and then vichar sagara also is going to be a very simple uh, explanation i am not going to go to the details uh, because it's a very big text but i want to introduce those texts for people who are interested okay so let's uh, close for the day om purnamada purnamidam purnahat purnamudachade पूर्णस्य पूर्णमाधाय पूर्णमेवशिष्य ओ शाति 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 हरि ओं श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि थैंक यू आई विल टेक सम क्वेश्चंस इफ यू हैव एनी इन द चैट आई कैन सी सम थिंग्स okay the first question uh, i don't know who it is from uh, deep sleep awareness can only be understood only when we are awake is there any other state in which we can be aware of this awareness or it can't be understood at all by means of the things made out of the five elements you are right we can never understand uh, that particular state except through the words of the scriptures that is why it can be known only from the scriptural words atma definitions in all the upanishads are revealing that state there is nothing else which can reveal that nothing else. even in the waking state it is only when you go through those scriptural statements and apply that as you aham brahma asmi tatva masi these are all the statements which uses which we use to realize in our own mind that state if you have further questions you can always write to me i can speak to you directly on this vijay is asking like snake on rope indirect knowledge indicates direct knowledge yes you are right uh, vijay you are right like 10 men example also yes you are right i know it is dark i am aware there is no need for any knowledge light or we i know that i am i am even if it is dark yes uh vijay you are you, you i think you are probably answering to the first uh, person but whatever you said is true the above is experiential or or pure being awareness okay i know i am okay the, what you are saying is the 10th man it's it's, it's saying that uh i am finally claiming that atma is the final way in which one can realize that pure state no other way 
you cannot say Brahman exists. You have to say, I am that Brahman. I am that consciousness. I am. You cannot say that consciousness exists. That is, no, that is indirect knowledge. That is what we learn initially. That in Tathobhada, yes, there is one consciousness called Satyam Jnana Manantam. But now, we have to apply that knowledge to our own nature. Uh, today, you have at least one person you have finally managed to convert me to a total Vedantic. Okay. Uh, Shama, I'm glad to hear what you say. Uh, okay. Uh, anybody else has any other questions? Uh, Shikaji. Baba, bolo. Uh, how does Maya reveal uh, samsara in the Jiva, Jagrat, and Ishwara format? Yes. You see, Maya means what? Maya means it is the mind. Our mind, it is the revealer of the samsara. You see, uh, all the thoughts of sorrow which we face is the mind. And this mind is called as Maya. So mind reveals the sorrow in the Jiva Jagat Ishwara format. That is what I meant. <coughs> now it's clear, so, right? What have the samsara do to samsara means what? It is you replace the word samsara by sorrow. It is due to the identification wrong identification with the body and mind. I am the jiva who is living in this body. I identify not with the consciousness principle, but I identify with the matter principle, which is the body. And then I say I'm 75 years old. I am, you know, uh, I have got so many problems in my life. I, through the body, I identify with the world. Without the body identification, I cannot identify with the world at all. Therefore, what the scriptures teach us is, stop this identification, claim that you are consciousness, then you will have no samsara. No samsara means no sorrow in life. Because you, you say, this is only intellectual. That means only in the mind. You see, we still have to lead our life in our waking state. We still live, uh, lead our life as if we are in the, uh, as if we are a jiva with the body. We can't, there is no other way we can lead in the waking world. But only when we want to realize who I am, at that time you say, I am that Atma. Even when you go to sleep, you say, Bhagavan, you have taught me today, I am Atma, I am pure consciousness, I am not the body, I am not the mind. Again, tomorrow when I wake up, I will wake up with this thought that I am not the body and mind. This body and mind have been given to me for a few years to come into this world, see, have some experiences, but they are not my real home. My real home is that pure nature of mind which is not only my nature, it is also your nature, which is Bhagwan's nature. Because it is one unifying principle called Atma, which is revealed by the scriptures, revealed by Bhagavad Gita, revealed by all the Upanishads. And it tells me that that is what is my real home. Anybody Shekhar, yeah. Shekhar, Shekhar, uh, yeah, one minute, let me finish with Bhaubai. Yeah, Bhaubai, bolo. This, uh, this, what, I, uh, what you mean to say is, as long as we are caught in the Maya, yes. the samsaras are there. Yes, you are right. Now you got it. Absolutely. As long as you are trapped in this mind and think that the mind is me, you are in samsara. Okay. The moment you Thank drop you. the hold of the mind on you and say, I'm pure consciousness, I'm observing the mind, I'm the observer, I'm not the observed mind, you're free from samsara. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> no, it'll come, it'll come. You have to just remind yourself. Every day, just get up and say, I am the Atma, that's all. When you go to sleep also, you say, I am the Atma, that's all. 
it is difficult i agree with you it is not easy but we try mr shek yeah yeah jacqueline uh i am particular uh, caught by the of course it was all uh, you know you mentioned it the one that was talking about actionless and the karma is the action yes so the atma is the actionless yes and the karma is the action yes. so basically uh what we are doing is basically the action illuminate the actionless and therefore we know we 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 are aware of what it is yes you are right you you got you you are right in your thinking through action we come to know that i am actionless atma but then but then if we if we are actionless uh, basically uh, whatever that things that happen now i'm coming back okay things that happen to me to you or to everybody Yeah. Uh, in fact there's no control at all it just happens absolutely happened. no control you're right once you have once you see yourself as pure consciousness what happens to the body and mind is left to the creator that's all yeah it, it just happens whatever let's say today i eat a uh, abc uh it seems like it's like being directed into a way that uh i'm directed to eat abc yes exactly Oh. all the experiences you have then you just say this are all uh, incidental it happens to the body because of some law of nature that's But all it's super, it's super profound you know because when we it come is. to the world yes. uh, then we supposed to be like no mind actionless and everything and and then somehow we are given all this of course happiness then we say wow wow but then if it's sorrow we say no no you know so it's like yeah. what is going on yeah you see the happiness which we see in the world is only a reflection it is only it's a only a medium for me to realize that i am that pure bliss ah the the happiness is to realize that that is my pure bliss yes i, I am the pure too. bliss what what i am seeing is only a reflection it's just a medium my daughter my son my uh, my husband they are all what they are only mediums to tell me that uh, they are they are only mediums to for reflection of happiness but the real happiness is atma uh, so the 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 reflection of the happiness supposed to be the su- subset of that blissful yes you are right it's just a subset it's just a, a reflection means it's like you see the reflection in the mirror right it's like that you receive the reflection in all the objects and beings in the world Okay so the sorrow one is it shouldn't be in the book at all Sorrow is also a part of the nature of the mind which has got which is as per the law of some action i have done in the past that's all uh, See sir, suppose i experience some sorrow the way you should say is it's some law which is there which governs this action reaction action reaction actually sorrow is nothing but it's just a thought in the mind it comes nobody knows why it comes when it comes how it comes but it comes yeah that's the profound part you know yes okay. nobody knows nobody knows tomorrow morning what you will wake up with which is horror which which problem is going to face you yeah there is a there is a profound part you know what is life <laughs> yeah see you that is why they say don't try to over analyze life because it is all maya it is all a play going on it's a play of the universe nobody can understand nobody will come to a real conclusion in life that this is what is the reason behind this maya so nobody if, can say so if it is positive you just be happy if it is negative you also be happy just take it and accept it and go exactly that's it you got the life principle this is the mantra for the life Whoa, super profound okay i'm going for that <laughs> but super okay. profound <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> okay jacqueline thank you uh, shama you had a question yeah no basically um, i just wanted to make a comment that today i have understood two things yeah one is the first one is what drives you to teach vedanta because you are, you obviously you have understood it so thoroughly well and the natural outcome would be that you will be compelled to teach so it has become your swarupa you know manner of speaking 
The second one is why the scriptures deal with, the, because when you were teaching last time, Nesh Karma uh, Siddhi, I was thinking, why, why is this text, you know? I mean, are these, is there anything new? And I realized, yes, of course there is new. And the, uh, the interesting part is about the objections raised and for Sur Suresh Acharya to actually confront and answer those. Mm -hmm. Because inadvertently, when you're teaching and we are learning any knowledge, it, the mind actually on its own, it is giving so many objections at a conscious and a subconscious level, which actually hampers our progress because you're not truly able to embrace it. So today I realized that if one is reading the objections which he's confronting, then somewhere I'm actually clearing up my own objections. Yes, so you're I, right. Uh, so I realized the value of the text, you know? Because last yes. time I was thinking, I was almost going to write to you and say, just tell me what is new in this. <laughs> yeah, but that's correct. I, yeah. I, I realized the purpose of it. So, yeah. and, and, and lastly, it is said, um, and then I have one question that, the format that you have chosen is just a very, very systematic. Your, the last bit, the triangular format and the binary is just absolutely superb. I'm sure this is very much your own creation. You know? Yeah, it is my is own it, creation. I mean, I just Because, thought, <laughs> because this is, I, I could see it's not in any of the scriptures, but no, I, no, I feel- No, no, it's not my own <laughs> creation. I know it's not my own creation. I, I just decided to write today and just present it like this because uh, what I have presented today is what I have written, but it has been pr presented by uh, Swami Paramatmananda in this fashion. Uh -huh. No, but it's so clear, you know, that yeah. the first and foremost, you must clear that Jagat Jiva Ishwara, and then you must move on to the Atma and Atma principle. You know? Yes. Because, and it's almost logically, the mind will go there. The, the only one question, which I want to make sure I've understood it right, the Maya Shakti, which is there, is nowhere out there. It is very much from our own uh, mind itself, isn't it? 100%. 100%. It's only and the Shakti means you just sit down in meditation, you will realize this Shakti. And the ignorance that is created by the Maya Shakti is actually eventually cleared uh, the more Nyanam Ivan is able to do, then the ignorance doesn't matter anymore. Yes, that's correct. You see, the ignorance drives away this Maya out of your mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's very, very thank logical. You. So thank you. Thank you so much. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else has any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll close and then we'll see you next week. Uh, I will, uh, we'll start the Shruti Sara Samudarnam. Thank you and good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Sikaji. Thank you. Shruti, sorry, my mic was muted. I actually had a question. Yeah, yeah, Rohit, uh, how did you find the text? Oh, was super. Uh, thanks. Sorry, I couldn't attend last week, but I yeah. saw the uh, video uh, last night and I made up for this lesson. Yes. Uh, and I also interestingly found out that you were looking for me during the last class. Yeah, I was looking for you. That's, I know that you are around today, so I repeated the whole of for 20 minutes, so it's only your benefit. Thank you very much, Shekhar Um I had a few questions. Uh, yeah, one was... Uh, what is the meaning of anirvachaniyam? Anirvachaniyam means indescribable. Maya is indescribable. It, you, can, you cannot say whether it is sat, you cannot say whether it is asat, it is, uh, or it's a mixture. It is existent, it is non-existent, or it is existent come non-existent. Okay. okay. That is what is called as Maya. Okay. No, and the, and the, the best example of Maya is dream. Uh -huh. So dream, you cannot say whether it is existent, whether it is non-existence, but it is appearance. Right. So uh, then what's the relation between uh, Sat, Asat and Mithya? I understand that Sat and Asat are uh, opposites, uh, yes. like real and unreal. But Mithya is that which is uh, real while we experience it or like an appearance, right? 
Yes, that's correct. Mithya means it is real while I'm experiencing it, but it is unreal. So is it not, is it, um, um, is it Asat itself or is it neither Asat? No, not? it is neither Sat, it is neither Asat, it is a third category. Okay. So this, this, is, this the... is, yeah, this, this is a third category in Vichara Sagara, the, uh, the author Nishala Dasa, he beautifully brings out and says that there exists in this world a third category called as Mithya. Normally, people do not accept that there is a third category. They only say if the sense organs perceive something, it is called as existence. If the sense okay. organs don't perceive anything, it is called as non-existence. What the rishis, what the, uh, have found out is that there is a third category which is neither existence, you cannot call it existence because it goes away. It can be negated. Our waking state can be negated in sleep. Yes. And the dream state can be negated in waking. And both waking and dream are negated in sleep. Right. So therefore what? There is a third category which is called as Mithya. It is, Mithya is, a, uh, is created by only the Vedantins. And, okay. and to understand Mithya, and then what did they say? They said Mithya means like rope snake. Rope snake is Mithya. Mirage water is Mithya. Dream is Mithya. But Mithya should have what? It should have a substrate. It cannot exist by itself. Right. Therefore, they bring out the point of Atma. Then they discovered Atma to be that substratum, which is the substratum for the entire universe, which is called as pure consciousness. Got it. Got it. And then you hold on to that as your real nature and be free. Whenever you are in transacting the world, you be like the body and mind and transact with the world. But when you want to uh, just come out and uh, drop your uh, dress of the ego and the body and the mind, then you know who you are and then you're totally free. Therefore, you wear the ego eye dress for Vyavahara and drop it to know you are Atma. Got it. Um, then uh, the next question I had See, was... Once, uh, once you understand this, then all your mandukya becomes very easy. Yeah. See, the senior student, I told you, just use that formula of, uh, you know, the projection, waking is a projection of me, the consciousness. The dream is a projection of me, the consciousness. I am the pure consciousness, Turiya. In five minutes, it's over. Right. Yeah. Uh, the in the Mandukya, Shikhi, why do they say that um, the the dream state and the waking state uh, arise from the sleep state? Is it just because of uh, as a reference point? Because because, um, because the the sleep state is the state of ignorance. It is the ignorance of Atma which is covering the nature. Ignorance has got two aspects. Number one, it is covering the nature of Atma. Ignorance has a second function. It will project. It will project. So it projects the dream state. It projects the waking state. Oh, like what? Like what? Exactly like the ignorance of the rope. It projects that it is a. Uh, it is a. It is a mala. It is a. Uh, it is a snake. It is. A, it is a rod. The five different people. They will project as five different things because they are using their own imaginations. Right. So the Shakti, that is why I keep on saying that our mind and that Maya Shakti is one. So it's not because the deep sleep state is, in terms of its uh, attributes, it's very close to uh, the Atma state. No, 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 no. Yeah, in Mandukya Upanishad, the Gaudapada Acharya says very clearly, uh, deep sleep state is the cause, oh. because uh, the, the, for this world, there has to be a cause. World is an effect, like rope snake. Right. Cause the like like uh, ornaments. 
it's an effect but the go gold is the substance so what is the substance of this uh, the substance is ignorance therefore okay. they say therefore they say that you analyze the world for 150 years of your life you will never come to a conclusion what the world is you can go okay. on analyzing the world ultimately you will never reach a conclusion only because it is ignorance based you will say in the end i don't know that's all right from the beginning the scriptures telling you you know you will never know so you accept the scriptures and forget about it and just hang on to atma that's all okay got it sir is clear right yes and i have one last question here yeah go ahead uh, so in the analysis in mandukya also um it says i can't remember which portion of it so it says that um so in the dream state we can't we are only conscious of the dream state when we are um, in the waking state while we are in the dream state we cannot be conscious of that state is it because in the dream state there is the absence of the intellect no 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 see dream state is uh, is like as in while we are dreaming we can't be aware of the fact that we are currently dreaming right? we can uh, only be in the waking state and then negate the dream world saying that such so such. you have to wake up from that state to drop that state right so you have my... to drop you have to wake up to the atma state and drop the waking state uh, knowledge is because knowledge is responsible for ignorance ignorance will go away only when knowledge comes the knowledge of the waker helps you to drop the dream state similarly the knowledge of waking state the, the knowledge of atma will help you to drop the waking state and that state um, is it the state that they call samadhi no samadhi is just a simple like uh, it is just a simple it's a thoughtless thought, no no it's right. just a thoughtless state i see okay. don't give too much attachment to samadhi if you are a vedantin right uh, samadhi is just a say okay, you know don't even bother about it uh, uh, shankaracharya says samadhi is just a say, uh, some yogis they want to be in that state that's all it is just a relax a relaxation state but it will not give you knowledge the knowledge which you have from the vedanta is it you have to go beyond the thoughtless state and claim you are atma this is where yoga stops with thoughtlessness vedanta starts after thoughtlessness it says go beyond and see who you are you are the witness of the thoughtlessness right okay so that is that state which is beyond the waking state yes that is the state which is called as beyond the waking beyond the dream beyond the sleep state okay and like you mentioned where uh, the thought itself a single thought itself reveals the seer so when you drop that thought all that's left is you the seer that's it correct okay okay and that is only knowledge you see right. that you can get only in the waking right hey, what confused me was the part that where is why that is why the scriptures say you just claim and understand that that is your real nature and get that knowledge and be free right yeah what confused me was the part where it said um, you have to be in a waking state to drop the dream state so you have to be in the state of atma to drop the waking state i was wondering what that state itself was like no 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 it is it is knowledge only knowledge it is just only. a knowledge of atma which will make you drop the waking state right. and claim that atma as your nature right understanding is the final is the final answer for knowing the truth right that is, you must be very clear is got nothing else apart from understanding that is why they say till the last minute use your intellect and then finally drop the intellect the intellect will automatically draw get drop when you have the knowledge that uh, you know in the, in the in that turiyam state there is no there is no intellect also there is no mind also there is no world also there is no sense organs also therefore i am that that's it that's the only knowledge and that that that, that is why it is called as jnanam satyam jnanam anantam bhagavad okay yes 
No, I got it. Thank you. This I was listening to a lecture by Swami Sorupananda of the Ramakrishna Mission, yeah. uh, based in New York, on the seventh uh, mantra of the Upanishad. And somebody mm-hmm. asked him the same question. I didn't quite understand what they asked. Neither did I understand his reply entirely. No, like I caught no, part it, of the question. So. Yeah, it's okay. It's uh, now, now you. Thank you for clarifying right. that. Yes. Yeah. You see, once you go through Vedanta, all these advanced texts, your mind will get so clear and you will see that Atma brilliantly. See means, I'm just using the word see, but actually it is just the knowledge. I saw your notes from the Nachkarma Siddhi. It's so exhaustive. Uh, uh, why do you, uh, Shikhi, why do you say that chapter 2 is more important than chapter 3 because chapter 3 has the Mahavakya Vichara yeah it has got Mahavakya Vichara but he, you know uh, if you know chapter 2 well then Mahavakya becomes very easy Easy. Okay. the most important thing is to have this Atma and Atma Viveka which can be done by reason your intellect can be used for reasoning and come to a conclusion. That's what in Nashkarma would be, uh, Nashkarma said that the commentators will say finally that uh, it's through reason I can I can finish the first portion of Atma and Atma Viveka. Then the second portion is I apply the scriptures. Now I I I know what the Atma and an Atma is. Now let me apply the knowledge of the scriptures and own up Atma as Brahman. 